or a bus versus them, cyclists have two enemies on the road. And one of them is drivers, careless drivers, and then, you know, asshole drivers who are like trying to play with you, you know, like trying to teach you a lesson. And then the police. And so really what I've been doing and what I spend all my, my working time doing is representing cyclists and protecting them from the dangers and the problems that they face and trying to deal with the harms they face from these groups out on the street. So a lot of it is the personal injury cases. People get hurt. They don't have health coverage. You know, they want to get back on the bike. You need health care. Um, you can get that, you know, if you... If you do what you have to do, you jump through a bunch of hoops, there's a lot of paperwork, you know, you're going to get the health care you need so that you're not crippled for life, you have a broken bone, you can get back on the bike, you can continue on with your life. You know, at our law firm, we represent at any given time about 60 or 70 cyclists who've been injured by drivers. The other part is, has been suing the police, first over the critical mass stuff, and, and then over their failure to investigate and bring justice to drivers who harm cyclists. So um, now I'm going to get into the, the timeline part of this. Like, you know, my feeling as you know, a white commuter cyclist in New York City before I had this kind of political awakening around the post-RNC crackdown was, you know, I was invisible. I could pretty much do whatever I wanted and cops just weren't going to bother, and, and I did. Um, you know, and, and there's a dual aspect so to the police. On the one hand, they're, they're harassing sometimes and giving us a problem. On the other hand, if you're in a crash, you've got to get the police there. You are sunk. You don't have a plane. You don't have health coverage. You don't have anything unless you get the police there in the scene. You have to make them do their jobs for your benefit. So that's this weird kind of dual aspect of our relationship as cyclists with the police that you have to be mindful of. Um, June 2005, the first ghost bike was installed. I think it was a really important step to raising people's awareness of how many cyclists were getting hurt and killed on the streets. 2004 to 2006, you had this post-RNC crackdown. I only learned this later after we filed a lawsuit against the NYPD and got all the discovery that is all their records showing what they were doing. But I'll never forget the day with Bill DePaula and Austin Horst. We were in my office. We had just gotten all these videotapes from the NYPD after getting a ruling from the judge. They didn't want to turn them over. We look at these videotapes, and it turns out that these events, the moonlight ride in Central Park, these family rides, these completely innocuous bicycling events, they were sending cops in wearing cameras on their bodies to film people to see what the cyclists were doing, to see whether they were, you know, what sort of disruptive activity were involved in. And this is a, a kind of